too slate. I am still figuring out how to do the Hangouts on Air because I don't use Google Plus, which uh, makes me just like everybody else on the planet because no one uses Google Plus. Um, so I'm still doing a little bit of, of figuring out how to um, to do everything uh, with it. So um, let me go ahead and send the link out to everybody. Publishing 101 live show happening now. Um, and if you are a live show vet, um, can you, if you would not mind, if you would um, be able to go to the live stream page and tell those people just in case some people are still at that page instead of um, having come over to the new one, I would do it, but I'm afraid trying to stream live and do that at the same time would result in the complete destruction of my, <laughs> of my internet connection. So it's also very weird because I can't see you talking yet, and I assume that some of you are, but um, I, I can't see. There we go. Okay, so uh, this live show is being recorded. Um, so I have not decided entirely yet if we're going to leave it up long term or not. Um, I might, uh, if, if you're watching this in the future, congratulations, I did indeed leave it up long term. Um, but uh, the, part of the reason I'm not sure about that is uh, the publishing industry is a, a very dynamic creature. It changes a lot. It shifts a lot. Um, and so I don't want to feel like I have to constantly remember, like, what did I say in that show? Is it still accurate? I'm not sure. Um, but I'll certainly leave it up for a little while. So there's that. Um, let me give people a few moments to get here. I'm going to go tell everybody on the Facebook page. And then we will get started, as one does. La, 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 la. Mm -hmm. I wish that chat thing worked, but I click chat, and I think it's just people that are watching from Google Plus instead of people that are watching from the web page. So that is frustrating. Um, Publishing 101, live show happening. OK. Um, and also, what's very strange about this is I can't see how many people are in the live show. So I just hope that there are some of you. Some of you are, in fact, um, are in fact here. <laughs> uh, I'll just hope for the best. Um, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and kind of get started. Let me make sure, is everybody here that wants to be here? I don't know. We'll see. It's very strange not knowing how many of you are here. I'm very uncomfortable with this. Um, so if you um, are not familiar with the, this version of the live show, the, the YouTube thing, um, if you comment, it shows up as a chat for me. There is a little bit of a delay. Um, because this is bringing a lot of new people that aren't quite as familiar with sort of the way that I do live shows, um, uh, if you copy paste the same question over and over and over and over and over and over again, I will intentionally ignore it because that is annoying. Um, if you ask me to take my clothes off, I will block you immediately. <laughs> if you uh, do anything that I don't like, I'll block you immediately because y'all are in my house and <laughs> and I'll throw you out. Um, but usually it's not a problem. We don't we don't typically have uh, any issues, so I'm not really concerned. I just want to make sure that was my cat. I just want to make sure that we're clear on a few things. So, um, it tried to make me change my name to my Google Plus name. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't really like. The, you know, we're still sort of seeing if this, if this uh, non-live stream. Um, anyhow, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. And now he's like sulking off, angrily. Um, but, uh, okay, so we're going to do uh, Publishing 101, which basically, we're, now I have cat hair. We're going to talk about um, sort of everything you need to know about publication. Um, I do, we're going to sort of do this in three different parts, uh, four different parts, yes. Uh, Pre-agent, like before you get an agent, getting an agent, getting a publisher, and post-publishing. Um, I would prefer if you have any questions, I'm going to open up for questions at the end of the, each section. Uh, but you should go ahead and have them ready because there is a delay and I don't want to be like waiting like, no, 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 what's going on? So um, be ready with questions. But um, if you have a question about like post-publishing, wait until we're into that section before before you ask it. That'll help thing keep things a little bit more organized. I do this a lot, by the way. I get very shifty and uncomfortable. Um, 
the comments seem to be updating only sporadically. I don't know what to say or do about that. I think that is just the way, the way of things. Um, okay, so uh, let's go ahead and, and begin, shall we? So let's talk about pre-agent. So this is um, this is for those of you that um, are just starting to write, or maybe you've written a few books. Either way, you haven't really started looking for an agent yet. Um, you're not even sure if you need an agent. You're not even sure if you want an agent. You're not really even sure what an agent is for an author. Um, this is this is pre pre everything essentially. Um, and sort of what do you do, what do you do at this point? So um, the number one thing that you want to do is, is write. I, I see so, so, so many people, and it is, it is kind of ridiculous, so many people that um, constantly say, like, I'm thinking about writing a book. How do I go about getting it published? And I'm like, you, you haven't written it yet? Because that's a key part of getting it published. Like you have to write the book first. Uh, and very, very unless you're like Snooky and you can sell your autobiography without ever like reading, then you've got to write the book first. You just do. Um, I don't really know anything about Snooky. Maybe she's a great reader. I don't know. I don't know her personally. Um, but really, the, the key is you've got to write. Write every day. Um, write different things. Challenge yourself by writing things that are outside of your comfort zone. Um, I am like so shifty today. Uh, write, I mean, I hate poems. I, I write poems sometimes to sort of change myself up and switch things around. Um, I, I try to, I, I, I mean, that's, that's all there is to it is you, you must write. You must write all the time or, or it's just not, it's just not going to work. So let's say that you're writing, you've got something sort of an idea in mind, you're headed towards a book length work so you're probably you know over 50,000 words give or take we'll get to word count in a little bit um, and you start to think you know I really would like to consider getting this published this really is something that I would like to see on a shelf um, I really would like to you know make some money off this I really would like to be a published author this is something I want to do uh, at that point what you want to do is you want to go to the bookstore and you want to study the bookshelves and you want to figure out where is your book going to be shelved is it going to be shelved in the fantasy section is it going to be shelved in the YA section? Is it going to be shelved in the middle grade section? Is it like a certain type of book? Is it like an author that you really like? Is it like this? Would you say, basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to answer the question, readers of X like my book. Like readers of what are people who are going to read your book? Um, and really study that and figure out exactly where it's going to be on the shelf. One, because that will probably help you sort of figure out who you want uh, for your agent, which we'll get to in a moment, um, and what kind of publishers you're looking at, but also because it will sort of help you figure out who your community is and, and sort of it'll help you feel less lost, honestly, because you'll be like, this is the box that I need to fit in. Um, and there is nothing wrong with fitting in a box, okay? Bookshelves are boxes. There is nothing wrong with fitting in a box. So this is where that I want, this is where I want to be, this is what I want to do. And then you're going to finish the book and then you're going to edit the book and then you're going to edit the book again and then you're going to edit the book until it makes you cry and you're not going to do this thing that people do where they say um, well I could change that but if I change that I'll have to change like half the book so I can't do that yes you can it's hard you don't want to do it I understand why but yes you can okay you're trying to create the best book not the easiest book okay the, the, the easiest thing if, if, if writing books were really easy everybody would do it. But as it is, everybody talks about doing it because writing, talking about writing is really, really easy and talking about how you're going to write a book someday, that's really simple. Actually sitting down and writing one is very, very difficult. So don't look for the easiest way out. Don't lie to yourself. Don't say, um, I can't change that because later this has to happen. Well, one of them is a problem, so fix it. Okay, don't make excuses for yourself. It doesn't help anybody and it certainly doesn't help you. Um, so just be very, very aware of that while you're editing. Um, I would suggest looking for critique partners. There are a lot of different ways you can go about finding critique partners. I think the number one way is becoming active in your community in terms of your online writing community. Um, I would, if you're writing YA, I would highly, highly recommend the Virla K boards. They're called the blue boards sometimes. Um, they are, uh, let me see what's going on over here. Um, the, the Virla K boards are awesome. They're fantastic. There's a really strong community of children's and YA and middle grade authors there. They are extremely good people. I'm a, I'm a big fan 
let me refresh this really quickly to make sure we're we're going we're going quickly. Um, don't mind me, just sitting here. Um, can somebody type some things in the chat box just to make sure that it's um, that it's working fine? I'm gonna I'm gonna do this while I wait. Let's see. Okay, thank you, Katie Wright, for typing "calcium which is how you pronounce that. Um, so anyway, uh, I would I would highly recommend finding critique partners. Um, I do not recommend. Uh, trusting a critique partner that you don't know well implicitly. Remember that at the end of the day, it is your book, and that is both good and bad. It is your success or it is your failure, okay? So what I'm getting at, though, is please don't get stuff back from a critique partner that you barely know and say, um, you know, uh, uh, this person says I have to rewrite the entire thing because they were offended by page three, so I'm going to do it. No, unless you agree with them, don't do that. Um, I am always a little bit hesitant about local writer groups for that reason, um, and I know that there are probably some really great ones out there, and if you have a really great one, that is fantastic. Run with it. I was a part of one for a very brief period of time. It was a lot of, um, it was a lot of people that had master's degrees in creative writing and doctorates in English, and they were writing like these brooding novels where like nothing really happened, and they all would sort of applaud their own work and I was like I wrote a book about genies and they kind of looked down on me and to be honest they kind of made me feel like crap about my own writing and that wasn't fair because they weren't a YA group they didn't know what they were looking at uh, they didn't they didn't know what it was and they weren't really my kind of people <laughs> at the end of the day um, so so just be aware of who your critique partners are and understand they are there to help you they are not there to fix you Okay, they are an assistant. They are a tool, just like anything else is. Um, so, so yes. Um, I don't know what to say about the comments not refreshing. I would just hit refresh and see what we can do. Um, so, once you have written the book and you have edited the book and you have edited that's a hard word to say and you've edited it again and you've worked on it so hard and you've studied the industry and you know what kind of book you have and you have polished it and you have made it the absolute best book that it can possibly be that's when you're going to start looking for an agent which is going to take us into part two for this section does anybody have any questions for me for the pre section? answer I'm going to hold on to my app as one does. Um, uh, if it's an agent related question then I am like wait for it because we're gonna get to agent stuff in just a second so if it's an agent question go ahead and, and give give it just a moment we're gonna we're gonna get there I promise. Um, anyone? Okay so it looks like we don't have really any questions about that section are we good? Maybe. We'll see. Um, can you repeat the website? Yeah, the website that I recommended is the Virla K Boards, V E R L A space K A Y, or they're also called the Blue Boards. Those are really great. Um, once we get into agent stuff, there'll be some other stuff, that, other websites that we're going to talk about, but, but the Blue Boards are a really fantastic community of people. Um, Live Journal also has a really good community of writers, and there's all sorts of Twitter chats, like like make friends and don't make friends with an agenda okay don't don't be like hi I uh, I just wanted to talk to you about you know so uh, just don't don't like schmooze people okay like just just make friends um, uh, somebody asked I'm editing at the moment and I find myself re um, repeating myself a lot in action scenes and finding them really dull any advice action scenes are hard to write um, I personally write them the same way that I write um, or I'm sorry I personally write them the same way they appear in movies, which is a lot of sharp cuts. Like my sentences are shorter. Um, I get rid of a lot of adjectives. I get rid of unnecessary words like then I got up. No, just I got up. Or sometimes just got up. Uh, and things like that tend to help a lot. Okay, so let's go ahead and go on to, um, to the agent section. Um, and I'm actually, somebody asked about quitting and we're going to get there, okay? But we're going to... Um, we're going to go on with that. How do you feel about editing services? Um, I think that if you are at a point in your career where you have the money to pay for an editing service, 
I, I think that that is a very reasonable expense, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more later. Um, I do think that you should not spend your mortgage on an editing service, okay? Um, but that said, if you're having trouble finding a critique partner or you want a professional opinion, I don't think there's anything wrong with paying for an editing service. Editing, it's hard to say. Editing service, as long as you know, first off, you trust the person that's editing it and you, you feel like, you feel confident they know what they're doing, all right? Um, I wouldn't send it off to a company by any means. I would make sure that you trust the person that's doing it. Uh, I, then I don't have a problem with it. Editing services don't come cheap. Uh, but if you have it to spend and you're not going to have to eat Cheerios for the rest of the month, I, I do think that's a pretty reasonable expense. Um, not everybody uses them. It's really a personal, a personal thing for you. Um, I'm editing right now as well, and I feel like my novel is falling to pieces instead of falling together. Is that normal? Yes, it is. Um, I'm going to do a little plug here for the program Scrivener, which I talk about online a lot, and I'm sure a lot of you, um, a lot of you use it. Uh, it is available on both Mac and PC. I have a Mac, and the, I will, I won't lie, the version for Mac is a little bit better. Um, the PC version has a few bugs, but I love Scrivener. I love Scrivener so so, so, so much. And I wish I was able, I'm probably going to do a Scrivener show once just to show you how I use it. Um, it helps me organize my thoughts better. It helps me see, instead of sort of having this massive file that I don't understand, um, it helps me see things more clearly. It does take a tiny bit of getting used to, guys, but only a tiny, tiny bit. They even have a new feature where you can set things up in pages so it would look just like it would in Word. So if you're one of those people that likes to know where you are on the printed page, that would help. Um, it has an amazing uh, research function in it that's really fantastic. You can color code things. If you're like me and you do a lot of multiple points of view, when I'm using Scrivener, like when I was doing um, Fathomless, um, my two and a half points of view, um, I had each one color coded a different color. And it's, it's fantastic. It's really, really fantastic. I highly recommend if you use Scrivener, um, watching the uh, the Scrivener how-to video that they have and, and like taking some time with it, you know, see how to use it. I use it a little bit differently um, with every book, so. Um, okay, so we're going to go on to agents, but I'm talking really fast and I can't breathe, so I'm going to. Um, the reason I was late is I had another giant cup filled with sweet tea and I spilled it all over my desk, and my desk is like a little bit sticky now. going to have to clean it, like I have all my stuff here. It was not good. I used a towel. It's over there somewhere. I don't know. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, there's somebody just asked a question uh, about where do you start. Um, and I was talking to a really close friend about this the other day. Um, asking um, where to start a novel is like asking um, where do you start walking. Like I, I don't know with the first step. You start wherever you want to start. You can start, if you're having trouble and you can't seem to write that first paragraph, I assume if you have an idea for a novel that you have um, something in your head, like a, either a scene or a moment. If you've got a scene, then start with that. It doesn't matter if it's halfway through the book. Start with whatever speaks the loudest to you. Um, I do find it easier now to start at the beginning, but that wasn't always the case. In Sisters Red, I wrote a scene that's almost two-thirds through the book, and I wrote that first. So... It's really very personal and it's really up to you, but I noticed that um, I kind of think that starting a book for a lot of people is like starting an exercise and diet regimen. Like it's like it's like trying to start losing weight. It, it seems so overwhelming that the idea of like it's just why even bother. It's so it's it's too big. And the truth is, I write long books the same way I write short emails, which is one word at a time. That is the way everybody writes books one word at a time. That's the only way to do it. So you can split it up into different sections if you want. You can do whatever you want to do, but um, but yeah, yeah, there's there's really only so many ways to start and you've just got to figure out one that works for you. Um, again, I do want to reiterate, if I had a dollar for every person that told me they were writing a book and then didn't write a book, I would probably be like a billionaire by now. I, people so frequently tell me that they're writing a book and nothing ever comes of it. Don't be one of those people. One, because those people annoy the shit out of me. Two, <laughs> because you can write a book, okay? You can do it. Anybody can do it. It's just what separates the men from the boys is the people that are actually going to sit down and get it done versus the people that are going to wax poetic about how one day I'm going to 
right, this bestseller, I'm sure it's going to be fabulous. Like, no, no, it's not because you're never going to do it, okay? Either do it, like put up or shut up, seriously. <laughs> That's my advice to the world. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and start with, um, let's go ahead and start with, with agents now. Um, and I'm going to add a question that I just saw to my questions at the end. Okay. So getting an agent. Um, an agent is somebody that is going to be your business representative for all things writing. Um, this person is going to be paid about 15% um, for all of the, um, all of the, we'll get into this in a moment. They're going to be paid about 15% of everything domestic that you do. So every, every, every U.S. sale you make, they're going to get 15%. And most of them get 20% for, for, for foreign sales. So for example, um, if my book came out in the U.S., my agent would get 15% of that. And then if my agent sold it to a German publisher, my agent would get 20% of that. Um, why do you need an agent? You need an agent for a lot of different reasons. Um, again, this, is, this person is going to be your business representative. I'm talking too fast again. Um, and if you are new to the industry, the industry is very, very difficult to navigate an agent without somebody that has been there before, that knows how to negotiate, that is able to negotiate without an emotional bent on what they say, which is really, really difficult for some people. So I highly recommend that. I cannot see myself any in any like version of the world not having an agent. I would always want an agent, and I highly recommend them to you as well. Um, the industry is honestly a little bit frightening without one. Um, so um, you're going to get an agent by looking for, a, um, first off, you're going to write a query letter before you even think about the agent, honestly. You're going to just write your basic sort of stock query letter, and you're going to customize this for each agent later, but you're going to start with kind of a stock query letter. This query letter is going to have a section on sort of who you are and why you're writing a letter to this agent. Um, what they need to know about your book, it's the, the hook, the pitch, and, and then sort of, uh, um, I, I hope, thank you for your consideration, um, I hope to hear from you soon, sincerely, Jackson Pierce, um, or whomever you are, please don't sign my name. <laughs> um, my hair is doing the thing, it's doing the thing, why does it do that, we don't know. Um, so there are a lot of different uh, places online that you can learn how to write a query letter. They're all over the place. Um, one of my favorite is, favorites is if you go to agentquery.com. Um, there's a really, really fantastic site there. And then um, for that middle section that I was just talking about, which is kind of what we call the pitch in the industry, which is the, you know, the, the big one-two of what's my book about and why are you excited to read it? Here's why. And you can actually do this if you want to. Um, that, uh, that's called the, the, the pitch, and if you hold on just a second, I'm going to find a true, here we go, um, and I'm going to put this in the chat. Um, there's a link right here. Oh, I can't contain links. Comments can't contain links. Um, hmm, well, that is unfortunate. Uh, if you go to my website, and I'm going to put this, I'll put this in the um, info bar later. If you go to my website and you go to my frequently asked questions and you search for Sandra, um, under the frequently asked question, I've already written my novel, Now What? Um, there's an article that I've linked by Sandra Mitchell, um, who is a really close friend of mine and a really brilliant author, and she's written a really great thing on how to write the perfect hook and how to write the perfect sort of catch. Um, that query letter, you want to spend a lot of time on it, okay? Spend at least two weeks on it, even if you're not actively working on it for those two weeks. Spend a while on it. Try to write it from a different perspective. If, if you feel like your book is mostly a love story, try writing your query letter as if your book is an action story. Like, give it a few different tries. Try a few different things. See how things go. I think I just swallowed that the wrong way. <laughs> um, see how things go and, uh, and go from there. Um, but, but really spend, spend a significant amount of time on that query letter. So once you've got your query letter together and you've studied it and you've figured it out and, and it's not longer than a page and it's really only maybe three, four paragraphs. If you're getting into five paragraphs, you're getting a little risky. You've got your intro that says, you know, hi, I'm Jackson. I got a degree in English. I live in Atlanta. I'm 28 years old. I like long walks on the beach and I'm writing you because I want to see if you'd like to represent my novel, my YA novel as you wish. And then, as you wish, is about X, Y, and Z. Uh, and then you have this sort of little uh, thanks for your consideration, that little section. Once you've got all of that together, and it's beautiful, and it's perfect, and I could do a whole live show on writing the query, okay? The query is a big deal, so don't mess this up, all right? You only get one shot at it with each agent. 
So you've got to make sure it is all put together and lovely and beautiful, okay? Um, once you've got that all set up, um, you're going to look at what agents you want to query. There is a website for this that I really, really, really like, um, and uh, and uh, it's called agentquery.com. They have all the information for basically every agent in the industry. Um, they've got all sorts of information, who they represent, how they prefer to receive submissions. Do they like regular mail or do they like email? Do they want you to send a sample? Do they not care if you send a sample? Do they just want the query? Um, it'll have all the details for every single agent in the industry pretty much um, and sort of what, they, what they're after. You're going to decide who to send those query letters to and basically who you want to represent you um, by, there are a lot of different factors. Um, for starters, you're going to look for an agent who represents your type of book. Like not exactly your book obviously, but your type of book. So for example, I'm, I'm a YA author. I'm not going to look for a picture book agent. I'm not going to look for an adult agent. Okay, I, I write YA. I need a YA agent. That's, that's what I'm, you know, that's what I need. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I'm sorry, I'm reading some of the comments. Um, so, so you're going to look for somebody that represents what you publish, your, what you want to publish. You're going to look for somebody that is actively seeking new clients. And you're going to look for somebody that sort of seems to, to like the same types of books that you like. Um, for example, um, with As You Wish, um, I could not have gotten an agent that liked like really dark brooding books because As You Wish isn't a dark brooding book. So it wouldn't have been, you know, that agent's cup of tea. So once you've decided who you're going to send these to, I would recommend sending them out in batches of maybe five. If an agent takes over a year to get back to you, like personally, that's too long for me. To, to be honest with you, I would give an agent about six to eight months to get back to me before I moved on. Um, and, and I might even move on before then, um, just because you've got stuff to do. Like you're trying to start, you know, I wouldn't hassle them. I wouldn't send them emails about, hey, hey, where's chop chop? Where's, where's that response? But honestly, after that amount of time, I would kind of feel like if they really wanted it, they would have seen it already. Um, so I'm not sure I would wait much longer than that. But I would send out in batches of about five. Um, if you get a lot of rejections from your first batch, something's wrong with your query, and you need to, you need to give it another look. Um, there are several different types of rejections. There are the ones that are just, sorry, but this doesn't seem like something that would interest me. And then there are the ones that say, you know, I liked X, Y, and Z, but I didn't feel strongly enough. You know, things like that. They kind of give a little editorial thing in there as well. Pay attention to that editorial stuff because if you start seeing the same thing over and over, then it might be a problem with your manuscript. Okay? <sighs> Rejections suck. Okay? They're not fun. They're horrible. They make you feel like crap about yourself. They're, they're not enjoyable. There's really nothing good about them. They are a part of the industry. And if you are ready to get published, that means you are ready to get rejected. That means you are ready to look at the industry as a business. Because, I, and I say this all the time, when I am sitting in my house, <laughs> or a coffee shop, or wherever, and I am writing a book, that is a beautiful personal thing, okay? That's just me, and the words, and my ideas, and my stories, and I'm just going at, you know, I'm just, I'm just making it happen. And that's, that's beautiful, and that's an art. But once my books sell to publishers, those books have price tags on them, and they have barcodes, and they have designers, and they have editors. That's an industry, okay? That's a business. So if you are ready to go and get your book published, that means you are ready to be a part of the publishing business. And you have to understand that, that really, it doesn't matter that you spent seven years like cobbling your precious story that you love. If it's not a good book, it's not a good business decision for the agent to take it, so he's not going to. All right, it's not personal, and I know it stings sometimes, but you have to be able to sort of say, this is a business, and they're coming at it from a business perspective just like I am. Um, and I think a lot of people have a very hard time with that sometimes. Do not respond when you get a rejection, no matter how angry you are. Just let it go, walk away, remember that it's not personal. I know it feels personal to you, and it, and it is personal to you, but remember in the grand scope of things that it's actually not. Um, so I have been doing some um, part-time work at a, a relatively small publisher, um, and as such I get to see what's called the slush pile, which is basically all the unsolicited um, submissions. And these are basically queries. Um, now they're a, they're a publisher, 
they're a publisher that accepts unsolicited I'm seeing a lot of query letters and I thought I would talk to you a little bit about the mistakes that I see on these query letters that honestly I didn't even know people would make these mistakes um, don't type it in all caps okay all right um, don't talk about how all of your kids and grandkids and students love your books because that does not matter um, get the uh, get the agent's name and gender right okay Ashley Grayson YA agent is a man all right make sure you get the genders right um, do not use some sort of crazy font. Oh, a big one. Don't ask questions in your queries that the answer can be no. So if your question is, do you want to find out if Tango makes it to the ball? No, not really. Don't ask questions like that, okay? In fact, honestly, I just wouldn't ask. I mean, the only kind of questions that I think kind of work in queries um, are are things like, "Will so and so make it, or will she get you know shut out by the the in crowd?" And that can't be answered yes or no. So just don't ask any questions that are that are yes or no questions. It's a terrible idea, and I keep seeing it over and over. Um, if you are writing a a picture book, which I assume most of you aren't, because most of the people that um, that sort of follow me are um, are not are not writing uh, picture books. But uh, if you are writing picture books, tr you've got to be a really talented artist to do your own illustrations, okay? Uh, really, really talented. Um, I know people that have made their living as artists and still are not considered good enough to do children's books illustrations. So try not to do that unless you feel very, very confidently. What other mistakes do I see? No courier new. There are still a few straggler websites out there that say everything should be sent in Courier New. That's like film. Uh, film the film industry uses Courier New. Um, the writing industry uses like Times New Roman or Cal Calibri or whatever it is. Um, don't use Courier New. That's sort of an old, old school kind of thing. Um, so yes, okay. So uh, also there are a lot of books out there on getting an agent. There are a lot of um, books that include all the sorts of listings of agents. They are very expensive, and in my opinion, they don't have anything in them that's not already on the internet. So I would probably, I'm not saying they can't be useful in some ways, but I think that your $100, which is about how much some of them cost, like the writer's market books, things like that, I would say that your $100 are probably better spent elsewhere, honestly. Um, just my, just my thoughts. Um, is that all my agent stuff? It is all my agent stuff. Does anybody have any agent-related questions? Why does my hair do this thing? I don't know. know. Agent-related questions. Anyone? Just while I wait. I don't know why I do that. Um, what if you get an agent in the YA, but later you start writing adult books, or is that something to think about when you're well-established? If you know that you're going to eventually write adult books or middle grade books or picture books or whatever, I would look for an agent that also represents those things. Um, that said, don't feel like, if, if you're like, I just want to keep the option open, I don't know, I might. I would still be aware of that, but I wouldn't necessarily reject a perfectly good agent um, with that. Um, I just had a short story published. Does that really look good and boost my chances of getting an agent if it's in my query? Um, it does. Now, actually, let's talk about something really quickly. And I'm going to talk about self-publishing at the end of the show. Um, it's going to be a long, a longest show tonight. Um, I'm going to talk about self-publishing at the end of the show. But um, unless your self-published book sold like gangbusters, I mean thousands and thousands and thousands of copies sold, not gave away, sold. I would not mention that in your query. I personally would not. I don't think it's a good idea. Um, uh, and somebody else just asked something really good. Um, oh, but a short story. If you've had a short story published in a reputable like uh, collection or magazine or something, yeah, absolutely. I would totally mention that. Any publishing credit you have um, that is a notable sort of respectable publishing credit, I would absolutely mention. I just would really, the number one thing that I'm seeing at this publisher where I'm working um, one is people who just flat out, I mean, like spelling mistakes. Okay, come on. Like, you know how, like, run spell check, all right? Things like that. 
that I feel like are a giveaway. That all caps query, I was like, you have got to be kidding me. Seriously? Like, really? Really? That exhausted me. <laughs> um, but the main thing I see is people try to, like, be like, my husband's been saying for years that I should try to get my book published. And so finally, I cobbled together my stories that my kids loved when they were growing up. And I've put them together in this, you know, in this com little collection called Things I Learned from Grandma. And it's like, like, Grandma, <laughs> I don't mean the one to break your heart. But OK, so remember, this is a business. You are not asking somebody out on a first date. You are saying, here's who I am. Here's my awesome story. Hope to hear from you soon because you're going to want in on this. Peace out. All right? that That's the idea of it. Business. It is all business. Um, is it a good idea to mention any associations, connections you have with other authors? Only if you have cleared it with the other authors. I have had people um, message my agents in the past and say, you know, I'm really good friends with Jackson Pierce. And, and my agent would contact me and say, do you know this person? And I'm like, I think they might comment on my YouTube page every now and then because that is different. Okay. So, so if, if you feel really, if you feel really, um, really confident, then yeah. Do you think agents will support authors in the range of 16 to 17? That is a very good question. Um, and, uh, there are other things I'll say about this later. Um, they will. I don't think an agent honestly cares at all how old you are. All they care about is, is your book good? Is it a good book? They're not going to be impressed that you're 16 years old and wrote a book, all right? Now, I know most of the people around you probably are, and rightfully so, because it is an impressive feat that you should be very proud of. But they're not going to be like, oh, a 16-year-old, like, huh? Like, is the book good? Can they sell it? No, then it doesn't matter that you're 16, all right? Because, again, if you are ready to get a book published, you are ready to be in the industry and in the business. And if you're ready to be in the business, it doesn't matter if you're 16 or 60. It means you are ready to be business-like. Um, is it bad etiquette to actually say peace out? Probably. <laughs> um, uh, are there any signs of a bad agent? Yes, there are. Um, so there was one, there was this fantastic website called Predators and Editors um, that has lists of all different types of agents. Um, there's also one called, oh my goodness, I'm blanking out, Predators and Editors and Water, what is it called? Um, crap, there's another one, but I'm totally blanking on it. Let's just go with Predators and Editors um, that lists bad agents. If, um, if an agent asks for any money up front, turn around and run. Don't justify it to yourself and say, well, they needed it for, no. If they ask for any money before they have sold your book, no, okay? They make money when you make money. And that is the only time they make money. So don't give them any money. Um, if you notice that a lot of people um, are jumping ship from that agent, a lot of people are changing agents, that might be a warning sign. Um, there are a lot of different warning signs, honestly, about, about, I mean, to be honest, it's kind of not that different from if you were asking somebody out on a date. Like, do they not want to call you ever? Warning sign. Do they have a weird email address? Warning sign. Um, most uh, reputable agents now have either blogs or Twitters or some, Twitters, yeah, I guess that's it, or some way of, that you can contact them online. Do not pitch a book over Twitter or in the blog comments, okay? But something that you can sort of get an idea of who they are. How do you nicely decline an agent if you get multiple responses? Just something really basic, like I really appreciate your interest, but unfortunately I've chosen to go in another direction. I wish you the best. Since That's what I was thinking of. Absolute right water cool. Um, what will be the recommended length of a query letter? What do you think you should mention and what and what shouldn't you? Um, your query letter should be no longer than uh, two-thirds of a page. Um, does an agent make any money past the sale of the book to publishers? They will basically make 15% of just about everything you do. So like uh, uh, Stephanie Meyer's agent got 15% of everything Twilight. I mean 15% of Stephanie's cut of everything Twilight. That's a lot of money. That's a whole lot of money. All right. So they it is in their interest, best interest to work hard for you. Um, so. I'm talking too fast. Um, anybody else? Anybody, anything? Do this again, like I do. 
there's a pretty big delay now, so <laughs> it's a little bit awkward as I watch things go. Oh, and I'm hearing my neighbors are doing something, moving some things, I guess. Okay. <sighs> so we're going to go ahead and we're going to move on to publishers now. Okay. Um, uh -huh. I need to write another note down so I can answer another question later. So publishers. All right. So once you have an agent, um, you've sent your query letters out, um, you get responses back. People are like, oh my gosh, I would really, really love um, to represent you. Oh no, a lot of agent questions just came through. Let me get those um, agent questions at the end. Ugh, no. Do you still need an agent after you get published? Yes, I still have an agent. Um, if you have an agent that ends up leaving the business, do you have to go through the query process all over again? Um, yes, you do. My first agent did leave the business and disappeared kind of mysteriously. Um, and I did have to do through the, go through the query process all over again. That said, it's a little bit easier once you have some books on the shelf. Um, do you think it's a good idea to have an online following before submitting a query? You're doing the thing that we talked about earlier, which is you're getting you're getting ahead of yourself. All right, just you, you got to remember write the book, get this part done. It's a good idea to have an online presence, but don't start talking about I have 500 Twitter followers. Like, don't. That doesn't matter. Okay, it doesn't unless you're talking like you have 17,000 Twitter followers. It doesn't matter. So so yes, have an online presence, but don't think presence, but don't think of it as a means to the end. If you live in the UK, is it better to be looking for agents in the UK or in the US? That's tricky. I would personally want an agent um, in the UK if I lived in the UK, but I certainly wouldn't turn down a fantastic agent that happened to be in the US if I lived in the UK. So, um, so yes, how do you know if an agent is the right fit? Uh, remember that your agent is not your BFF forever. Your agent is your business representative. Okay, and if your agent stops being a good business decision for you, then you need to end that relationship. Um, but but don't don't feel like you have to be besties at everything you do. Um, so yes, uh, so okay, let's go ahead. And if you worked at, published a literary magazine, then then yeah, that totally counts. Do you have to have a finished book to contact an agent? I feel like we've already covered that. Do you have to? No. Do you need to? Like, yeah, because why would an agent represent a half-finished book? Like, yeah, finish it. Of course finish it. Um, remember, step one, like part one was write the book, finish the book, edit the book. All right. Okay. So uh, part three, publishers. Okay. So after you've signed with an agent, the agent has called you and you've said, yes, I want you to represent me. And they've, um, I thought, I must, okay, you're, okay. I thought he was looking himself in an untoward place on camera, but he's just licking his paw, so it's okay. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so you've got an agent, they're, they're eager to represent you. Basically, your agent is going to repeat the query process to publishers. They're going to contact publishers and say, hey, I've got this author um, named Jackson, and she's got this really cool book that I think you should read, and here it is. Um, please uh, let me know immediately if you want it. Um, different agents will have different ap approaches. Some of them are going to be like, you need to let me know about this really fast because this is going to sell big. And some are sort of more like, um, you know, whenever you have a moment, here it is, enjoy it, you know, have a lovely day, that kind of thing. It just depends on the different types of agents that there are. Um, so <laughs> they're going to they're gonna submit things to different editors at different publishing houses. Um, there are a lot of different publishing houses. There are um, sort of seven big ones in the YA industry, and I always forget one, but I'm going to try really hard to get this right. There is Penguin, there is Random House, HarperCollins, Little Brown, Scholastic, Harcourt, and I always forget one. Every single time, there's always one that I forget. I'm going to look over here at my... At my the, all, all this over here. God, I always forget it. Um, I have no idea. I, there's always, always, always one that I totally just zone out on and lose my mind. No, no. I said Scholastic. There's another one, and one of you in the comments will say it, and I'm going to feel stupid. <laughs> I guess we could say Knopf is a pretty big one. Um, but that's not the one that I'm thinking of, I'm pretty certain. Simon & Schuster, yes, there we go, Simon & Schuster. Dang it. <laughs> okay. 
Okay. Um, that said, there are a lot of really, really good smaller houses too. Um, Carol Rhoda is a small house that puts out some really good books. Um, Flux puts out some really good books. Harlequin Teen is um, a relatively smaller house that puts out some really good books. So there are certainly smaller houses out there that, that put out really fantastic YA books. Um, so, so don't feel like you have to go to one of these big houses, but your agent is going to submit stuff to all these different publishing houses, and then you're going to basically start getting feedback from editors the same way you got feedback from agents. Editors are going to say, I really enjoyed this. Would she be open to revision? Or, oh my god, I love it. I'm getting it a second read on it. Or, I'm, I'm so excited because I, um, I really like this element of it. Or, sometimes they'll say, I really love this, but it's too similar to another book that we're already publishing. Um, with Sisters Red, actually, Scholastic, the Scholastic editor that got it said that he really, really liked it, but it was, they already had a werewolf book on the, on the docket, and it was Maggie Steve Otter Shiver, and Maggie and I are very close friends now, and I still haven't forgiven her for that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, so you're going to get all of this feedback. Your agent should be willing to forward you that feedback. If they're not willing to forward it to you, then, I mean... Some agents don't feel like you need to know that kind of thing. I feel like you do, um, but I am very, very business oriented. So, um, so, so yeah, I would, I would definitely, I would want all the information. I would want those things forwarded to me. Um, so let's say you get somebody that's like, oh my God, I want it. This book is amazing. I'm very, very excited about it. Um, we're going to make an offer. Usually before they do that, they have to take it to something called acquisitions, which is this meeting where they figure out like basically how much they can pay for the book and how much they think the book will earn and, and sort of things like that. But either way, so they get to this point, they decide they're going to make an offer. At that point, your agent is going to contact all the other publishers that still have it and say, we have an offer on the table, would you like to make one? And they're either going to say, yeah, we want to get in on that, or no, we're not really interested, you know, go with it. Um, so if you've got more than one publisher, <laughs> I'm talking too fast, if you've got more than one publisher that wants to make an offer, that is fantastic. That is really, really good. Way to go. That is good news for you. Um, they might go to something called an auction, which is exactly what it sounds like. They're not actually bidding live like you, 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 um, it, where they can see each other. But basically, um, it'll be like get your best offer in, know that they're, you're competing with other, with other editors right now, and the house will put in their very best offer. Um, so that, that's always good. There's also something called a preempt, which is P-R-E-E-M-P-T, which is when one house makes an offer so big that they decide to pull it off the table and not go to auction after all. So um, uh, 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 Okay, and amounts. All right. So one of the, the big, big questions that I get um, is, how much do you make on average for your first book? And the truth is, is there is absolutely no answer to that question. There is not an average. And I know people are like, but there has to be an average. But I promise you there's not. Um, there are people that make $500 for their first book. There are people that make $500,000 for their first book. Um, there are people that make, uh, I mean, I know a lot of people that make between 12 and 15. Um, on their, not even their first, they just consistently make 12 to 15. I know a lot of people whose average is more like 50 something, so there is not an amount. That said, getting something published is a lot of work, so I personally would never probably sell something for less than $2,000 because it's way too much work. To be honest, that would have been my first book I would never have sold for less than that. Um, my number now is, is much higher. There are numbers that I won't go below. And it, it's, not, it's not arrogance. It's just that I'm very keenly aware of how much work it takes to go into a book. And so it becomes a question of, um, you know, do I want to put all that work in for, you know, $1,000? Or do I want to just write an entirely new book and basically try again? Um, and so that's sort of something that you'll have to decide for yourself. I really can't help you decide what that number is. That's really up to you. Um, one thing you can do is if you get a subscription to Publishers Marketplace, it's $20 a month. I highly, highly recommend it. Um, it's extremely helpful because you can see what's selling and sort of new deals that are being sold, which helps you sort of get in touch with the industry and follow things a little better and sort of know what, what the big new thing is and sort of be aware of what's selling to whom and where and, and things like that. And it also helps you choose an agent, honestly, because you can see what agents are selling a lot of books for a lot of money. Um, but uh, if you get on there, you can see they have different things. They call a nice deal 
is zero to $49,000. A very nice deal is like 50,000 to 100,000. A good deal is 100 to 150. A very good deal is 150 to 250 maybe. Um, and then you go up and up until you get into a significant deal, which is like 250 and up, and a major deal, which is 500,000 and up. So you can sort of sort of gauge where things are. Um, certain publishers certainly have deeper pockets than others. It doesn't necessarily make them better publishers. It's just a matter of what they can afford to put in. I mean, it's just bigger companies versus smaller companies. So, um, but uh, but yeah. So. Um, the next big question that actually this isn't a question I get, but this is a question I think people should be asking, is um, is how authors get paid. So when when that editor makes an offer on your book and they offer, let's say they offer ninety thousand dollars, okay? For what it's worth, I have never made ninety thousand dollars on a book in my career. I know a lot of people that have, but just to give you an idea, ninety thousand dollars is a lot of money for a book. Um, so let's say they're going to give you ninety thousand dollars for a book. They're going to pay you in three parts. They're going to pay you in advance. That's $90,000. Let me start this over because I just messed up. They're going to pay you $90,000 for a book. That $90,000 is an advance. So it's an advance on sales. So before you start earning royalties after the book comes out, you have to earn back that $90,000. So you have to sell $90,000 worth of books or foreign rights in order to start making royalties on each book sold. That's called earning out. I'm doing a lot of air quotes today. But it's called earning out. So they're going to give you a $90,000 advance. Um, they're going to give you that advance in three different parts. They're going to give you one third of it when you sign your contract. They're going to give you one third of it when you turn the final book in, like after when it goes to copy editing. Um, and then they're going to give you um, one third of it when the book is actually published. Okay, so three different parts. So $90,000 sounds like a lot of money, but the truth is with your first book, it usually takes three years to get it out. So I sold As You Wish. I'm talking too fast. I sold As You Wish in 2007. I finished it and turned it in in 2008, and it released in 2009. So I earned $30,000 each year, right? Only then, remember, you have an agent. I have my calculator. You have an agent, and the agent gets 15%. So, so you get $25,500 in 2007, $25,500 uh, $25, in 2008, $25,500 in 2009, or whatever your three years are, okay? Then that money isn't taxed. You have to pay taxes on it. All right, and because you're probably self-employed, you have to pay both sides of the self-employment tax. You have to pay it both as an uh, as a uh, employer and as an employee. Okay, I pay a lot in taxes. I pay about thirty percent of my income in taxes, if not more. Um, so it's a lot of money. So realistically, that ninety thousand dollar book deal is about eighteen thousand dollars a year. Okay, and I think that's a little bit generous sometimes. Okay, so. Uh, and that, that's, that's how it is, okay? There's nothing wrong with that. $18,000 is certainly nothing to sneer at, but $18,000 is not a lot to live on. I realize that, that depending on where you live and how you live and whether or not you have a second income in your family, that can be perfectly fine. Maybe you've got, maybe you're completely supported by a spouse and that is just $18,000 of fun money that you just got. Um, but either way, it, that is why it's very, very difficult for a debut author to just go full-time and become a full-time author, even if they have a big book deal, is because the payout schedule just makes it very difficult to support yourself. Um, so, I lost my train of thought. Payout schedule, support yourself. Oh, where you are able to quit your job, essentially, and to become a full-time writer is, for example, in 2012, Purity came out. Fathomless came now. I signed two new book deals. I turned one of those book deals in. So I've, I got five paychecks in 2012. So that's where you start to sort of build things. And it's like, okay, I can see this coming. That said, keep in mind that you're going to get a big chunk. You're going to get one big lump payment like twice a year and you have to make that last. And that can be very stressful and very difficult. So just be aware of it. Um, <laughs> once you, uh, let's see. Um, do I want to say anything else before we go on? 
I'm not sure. Let's talk about, um, well, you know, we're going to get into edits in just a moment. We're just at selling and getting a publisher right now. Does anybody have any questions about getting a publisher at this point? So this is not edits, copy edits, covers, release dates. This is literally just, just getting a publisher. Does anybody have any questions? What happens if the deal falls through in between the first and second or third parts of getting paid? Um, there's a little bit of, if they cancel it, I think you're often entitled to some part of it. If you cancel it, you usually have to return all the money. It kind of varies depending on how things are with the publisher. Like, for example, a few years ago, I was in an anthology, and the anthology got canceled, but I still got to keep the, the payment. Um, so it kind of varies situation to situation. Can books really get bumped or canceled after you've signed a contract? Yes. Um, the contract is definitely, that's why you need an agent to read your contract and to make sure they're negotiating the best deal for you. Do not just sign whatever shows up at your house, okay? Um, but yeah, they can move them to another year. They can they can do a lot of stuff. And so, so, so they can cancel it. The contract almost always has a section in it about how both you and the publisher can cancel it. If you decide you don't want to do this anymore, you can cancel and return the money. And if the publisher decides they don't want to do it anymore, they can sometimes cancel and return the money. Sometimes certain contracts, if the publisher cancels, just of their own accord, it's not reflective of your work not being what they want, then sometimes you can keep it. But it really varies. It, it really depends on your contract and how it was negotiated. Any other questions about getting an editor? Why did I not know the word just then? A publisher, rather? The, the people that are going to watch this after the fact are going to be like, there's just a lot of long pauses. Ow! I just hurt myself where she does this. Okay, I'm going to refresh and make sure. Um, any opinions about the ABNA contest, especially the winner's publishing contracts being with Amazon Publishing? I don't know what ABNA is. Um... Oh, you can get free magazine subscriptions from your library, and Publishers Weekly is one of them. That is pretty fantastic. Was it hard for you when you became a full-time author? It is hard for me now, okay? And I want to be very, very realistic about that. This summer, I was extremely broke. Now, let's, let's go ahead and clear something up right now. When I say I was extremely broke, I am keenly aware of the fact that there are people that are far, far poorer than me in the world. There are people that are far, far poorer than all of you here in the world because you all have the ability to have free time and an internet connection, okay? So let's just clear that up really quickly. But, um, but yeah, like I spent a huge part of 2012 very, very broke. Like I borrowed a lot of money from my parents. It's, so even at this point in my career, I still have a lot of struggles with money, and most authors that I know do. You would be amazed. Some of some authors that you probably think, like, they sell huge. They don't need to worry about anything. They struggle with money, and that, that's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult. It's really, really difficult to be a full-time author. Um, so, so, yeah, just be aware of that going in, that it can be very, very tricky. Um, how much do you get in royalties? Usually it's somewhere um, around... 6 to 8% for hardbacks and around 10 to 12% for paperbacks. But again, that varies and depends on your agent and how they negotiated the contract. Sometimes agents will negotiate a lower advance for higher royalties, for example. Um, so it kind of varies. Can you go to the publisher after reading the contract and ask them to change certain things? You can absolutely ask. That doesn't mean they'll do it, but you can definitely ask. You can definitely ask. Okay. Anybody else? Anything? Why does some go straight to paperback? Um, especially in YA, paperback um, sometimes sells a little bit better. Some books are just paperback books. They're kind of books that are, you're going to be mass produced a little bit. Uh, I mean, they're all mass produced, but there are certain books that are just paperback titles. And to be honest, I'm having trouble articulating why they are. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of different reasons. After selling your first book to a publisher, are you expected to continue selling your books to that publisher? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You can sell your books wherever you want to. Now, that said, um, in your contract, you probably are going to have an option clause, which means you have to give that publisher the right of first refusal for a book. So, like, I can't just be like, all right, I wrote this, but I, you know, I'm taking my other book and I'm going elsewhere. You have to wait until the terms of that option clause are fulfilled. So, usually an option clause 
um, their option period begins maybe like 30 days after you turn in the, the book that they bought um, and then they get 45 days to look at it and so they can stretch it out for quite a while um, Honestly, I would, uh, if you write a lot of books, I would try to not have an option clause in your contract. That's just me. Some people, some people really, really like them. And for a long time, editors tried to pitch it as, we're going to take it as one book, but we're going we're gonna to take one book with an option. But sometimes an option can tie you up. And so like, I, like you can't take your book out because you have to wait until the option clause is fulfilled before you can take it out to other publishers. So... Can a publisher fire you if some books don't sell as well as expected? They cannot buy any more books from you. Um, but once they've given you that advance, if you've fulfilled and you've turned in the book, that money is yours. Like you do not have, if the book tanks and sells zero copies, you do not have to give that money back, okay? The money, the money is yours. So um, does the publisher ever lose the publishing rights to a book? Um, I wish that I knew the exact answer to this. Usually the rights are seven years before they revert back to the author, I think. It's usually seven years um, from either the sale or when they go out of print. It might be seven years after they go out of print. I'm really not completely sure on that. I think it varies a little bit. Um, I wish I knew the exact answer to tell you because I feel a little bit silly that I don't know. But um, but actually, um, there's that there's a story called um, Things About Love. It's an As You Wish short story. It's in my Amazon store. Um, and Things About Love was originally published in an anthology um, called Enthralled. It's a really, really cool anthology. And um, it was originally in Enthralled, and the rights reverted back to me, and so I put it up online, uh, I, you know, because I had the rights again. So um, let's see. Um, okay, so I am going to go ahead and move on. Um, I didn't know Harkin was coming out in print, to be honest with you, and I think, I thought Caleb self-published it, so I don't, so he would have control over that because he self-published it, but I could be wrong. I'll try to look it up really quickly while we, um, while we go on with things. Um, I'm going to actually, I'm going to look it up right now. Yeah, Harkin is self-published, so he has complete control over that. I don't think it's coming out in print. I think it's just an, e I think it's an e-book. Um, but yeah, he self-published it, so he has complete control over that. Um, so let's go ahead and move on. So this is after you have your publisher. This is part four, and this is kind of our last part before we go into the frequently asked questions, and then I'll answer questions from you guys. Um, so please be thinking of them. Um, so... Um, so after publishing, um, you and your editor are going to go back and forth a lot about your book. You're going to go through editorial. Um, they're going to basically send you a giant letter. It's usually like five to 15 pages long, um, sort of outlining what they think needs to improve about your book. Um, it can be very crushing when you first get that letter. Um, one thing that helps me a lot personally is I go through them with a black marker and anything that's just filler, I cross out. So like, now, hi, Jackson. We've all had so much fun reading. No, I don't need to know that. Like, I don't need to know that you had fun reading, and I don't care. Um, we we're really excited about No, no, no. I don't care about that either. Um, so we have some concerns. Nope, I take out so we have some concerns. And then I just leave the sentence that is actually important, okay? Like, the, the whatever is actually important for me to understand, that's what I look at. And then as I fix those problems, I continue to black it out until I have just basically a whole page of blackout text. Um, that helps me a lot to stay focused. Um, sometimes you and your editor will have a disagreement and um, you have to find a way to work it out. Um, if you absolutely can't work it out, you can always pull the book. Um, they can always pull the book. Um, but you do, I don't want to say you, you get the final say, but know that having this final say might mean you have to pull the book if you're that insistent upon it. If you're willing to be flexible and to give and take a little bit, then, you know, maybe certain parts of it will change, but, but you'll be fine. Like, it's just, it's a working relationship, okay? It's give and take. You have to be, you yeah, just have to be able to, to be flexible with things. Um, one of the questions I get all the time, as soon as I say this, is, is there ever something an editor made you change? An editor never made me change anything. I chose to because that was the smarter career move. I have had some editorial stuff that has been soul-crushing, that has been... I mean, there were there was one book in particular that editing it was, I mean, I felt like I cried every day over editing that book. 
but I'm really proud of it now that it's out. Um, there are things about it that I liked the way I had them, but you know what? They're fine the way they are, and I love the book, and other people love the book, and so I don't have a problem with it. Like, it's totally cool. It's not an issue at all. So just be aware of that. That's, that's the process of, of going through these editorial things is you have to be flexible. You have to understand that they're coming at it from a, um, they've edited a lot of books. Um, they're interested in making your book sell. Remember, they're on the business side of things. And so you just have to be understanding and you have to work with them. Um, and you have to realize how to make your book the best book it can be, that you both have this. Um, so after you've gone through, you have anywhere from two months to eight months to do those. It really varies a lot depending on how they've scheduled you. Um, you'll turn in the book and it'll be the final turn and it'll go to copy edits. That's when you get that second payment that we talked about earlier. Um, copy edits is like the world's craziest spell check. Okay, they are going to, like, if you have a character put on a tie in chapter three and four chapters later he's wearing a polo shirt, they're going to catch that. Okay, they're going to catch every little discrepancy in the book, and it is awesome. It is incredible the kind of stuff they catch. Um, sometimes there are weird things, like uh, I, uh, some of the, sometimes the way I write stylistically, my copy editors are like, that's not technically correct, and I'm like, too bad. And, and so we sort of have that discussion about it. But copy edits are, are pretty straightforward. Um, they're kind of time consuming, but they're, they're very, very straightforward. Um, and then finally, you're going to get into marketing and covers and your release date. So um, number one, um, when I first sold As You Wish, I was so upset when my release date was on Amazon before I knew it. Now I watch Amazon to know when my release date is, OK? I have a lot of sort of opinions on this, but typically in the industry there are a lot of things that the author is the last to know. And it's not malicious, it's not because they're trying to keep you out of the loop, it's honestly because a lot of the people in your publishing house are just busy doing their jobs. And your job is to write books, and so they assume you're busy doing your job too, which is to write more books. Um, so there are a lot of tricky things about that. But um, uh, your release date, um, there are a lot of, there's not a, uh, there's not a magical time. There are benefits to every different time to have your release, so, so that varies. Covers. Covers are a big one. Do you get to choose your cover? No. You don't get to choose your cover. No, there's no exception to that. Why don't you get to choose your cover? Um, you don't get to choose your cover for a lot of reasons. Um, number one, your publishing house has a design team, and their job, we were just talking about jobs, their only job is to make you an amazing cover, okay? And to think about marketing and to think about will people pick this up off the shelf? And to think about are there other books that have covers that are too similar to this? And to think about, you know, is Barnes & Noble going to love this? Are the indie stores going to love this? You know, who is going to love this cover? What are we trying to say about this book? And they're going to design the cover. If you absolutely hate it, you can give feedback, and you can even get it written into your contract. You can get meaningful cover consultation written into your contract. However, at the end of the day, the publisher gets their way with the cover, okay? And there is no, I mean, that is all there is to it. The publisher is going to get their way with it. They're going to hope that you like it, They really, and they're going to try to help you to like it. Um, and sometimes they're going to, like, try to spin it in a way of describing it that you like it. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, they're going to get to decide. Like they're they're the ones that get to decide how to how to do that. Okay, um, it doesn't always seem fair. There are some books out that have terrible covers that I can't believe the publishers approved, and I know that the author didn't like. And I'm like, why didn't you listen? But that's the way of things. Okay, so it's not again, it's not personal. It's business. Um, so try not to get too caught up in it um, because there's there's no reason to get caught up in it, honestly. Why do so many books have crap covers? <laughs> I don't know. Um, a lot of times it's a money issue, honestly. Um, stock art is not cheap. Um, and so a publisher might not have the money to pay for a photo shoot. And, you know, those, like, when you see a book that has, like, parts that are raised, um, you know, that, uh, that, it, that costs a lot of money. When you see a book that has the shiny parts, the foil, that costs a lot of money. Um, my new Sisters Red and Sweetly and Fathomless covers have that kind of sheen to them that's really, really pretty. That costs more money. Um, so publishers have set a certain amount of money that they are able to spend on a book's cover. And sometimes that amount of money means all they can afford is stock art and the designer's time. And they can't really afford to, 
you know, do these crazy elaborate things, and, and that can be limiting sometimes. So, okay. I think that is everything I have about, wait, I have one more thing. Never mind. Okay. Lastly, after you've sold your book and you've turned it in and you're waiting for it to release, write another book. Okay. Don't write the sequel unless they've bought a sequel. I really don't recommend it unless you just have to write it. But I would really recommend writing something brand new and immersing yourself in it because otherwise you are going to go crazy waiting to sit about a new project and get into it and just be like, um, okay. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Uh, I'm, I'm going to do some frequently asked questions in a moment, but does anybody have any questions about post publishing and that whole section? Anyone? Can you put forth any opinions before they make the cover? Yeah, absolutely. You can, you can do that. Um, but just know at the end of the day, they're going to get to decide on it. And a lot of times they kind of have something in mind. There are some amazing covers out there too. Like the Sisters Red cover, the original one um, with the, the face, like I never would have thought to do that. That was genius. Like, so there are a lot of times that the public, like they put out a lot of really good covers. They're just sometimes when some publishers take a little misstep and you're like, huh, that happened. Hmm. So. Anyone? I should refresh to see if there are any. Ooh. Okay. Um, okay, so let's talk about marketing really, really briefly. Somebody's asking about book, uh, book tours, about um, if a publisher wants you to help in marketing. I would absolutely recommend getting a Twitter, having a blog, um, being active online. I would not recommend devoting your life to the internet, okay? Because the truth is, is I'm very active online. I, you know, I do videos, not, sometimes I have more videos coming out than others, my nose itches, um, but I'm, but still I do videos, um, I've got a website, I'm very active on Twitter, I answer a lot of email. I honestly don't think that it made a big difference with my sales. Like I, I just, I mean, it might have made a small one, but for the time that I put in, I just don't think it makes that big a difference. Now, there are exceptions, of course. I mean, if you're John Green, that's going to make a huge difference with your sales. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't, why does my nose itch so much? It doesn't hurt that, you know, his books are really good. Uh, but that I think if you're that level of sort of famous and celebrity on the internet, that that helps. But there are other authors that are extremely sort of famous internet celebrities that I can see their sales. And I'm like, that is not, for the amount of time you put in, that's not what I would expect it to be. Oh my gosh, guys, my nose itch is so bad. I don't know what's going on in my life. Huh. Um, so just definitely get involved. Just don't remember that your job is you're a writer, like you're an author. Like I, I am an author first. I'm not a vlogger first. I'm not a Twitterer first. I'm not a blogger first. I'm a author first and foremost. So my job is to write books. Everything else is just stuff I do for fun. Um, book tours, um, it depends on um, sort of your, your marketing and sort of what they, uh, no matter how famous you are, your publisher is going to have a set amount of money they can afford to spend on your marketing program. So maybe they're going to send you on a book tour, maybe they're not, maybe they're going to do other stuff. It really varies depending on what your book deal was and what they think they can do. They can do it. So they can do with it rather. I found you on Twitter before I read your books. That's the thing is a lot of people say, they found me on Twitter or YouTube, and so then they read my books. But and, and so I think that I think there are some exceptions to that. I, I, don't, I don't get me wrong. I think that that being active online has affected my sales. But I guess what I'm getting at is, if every one of my YouTube followers bought one copy of my book on release day, I would be I would not only be on the New York Times list. I would like own the New York Times list. Okay, but that doesn't happen. <laughs> so. People get so caught up and, you know, I, I have to get five more followers. Like, it's not, it doesn't, it just, it doesn't equal sales as exactly as you might think. I'm not saying that being active online is useless at all. I think it's really helpful and I, I really enjoy it, honestly. I really enjoy talking to you guys. I really enjoy doing live shows and videos and I really enjoy Twitter. Um, but, you know, find me Suzanne Collins' blog. There's not one. You know, find me Suzanne Collins' Twitter account. It's not available. It's not there. Um, so, 
you know, with that in mind, you don't have to, 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 be, to be a well-known author and to be a successful author, you don't have to be online. You can be, and I think it's fun, and I think it's worthwhile, and gives you a sense of community, because writing, at the end of the day, is a relatively solitary activity. And so I think being online and being active helps you sort of be in touch with your fan base and with your community and with your peers and your colleagues, and, and that's, that's fun. I will say I get more, I think I get more school visits and I get invited places like that. Um, I get in, invited and sort of I do more stuff uh, in that vein because of my online presence. So there is something there. Anybody else? Do you find it hard to meet deadlines? Um, it depends on the deadline. I've had some really, really fast turnarounds. Um, uh, I've talked about NaNoWriMo before, National Novel Writing Month. I, uh, and I have a friend that doesn't like it as much as I do. I really love NaNoWriMo because I think knowing how to write a very good book quickly is a very valuable skill. I've had two, kind of three books now that had to be written and turned in in less than three months. Um, not, not combined, but like each book had less than three months total. Um, one of those books had one month and, and it couldn't be like a crap NaNoWriMo novel. It had to be like a cohesive story. And, and so, you know, I would just be, uh, I think that it is worthwhile doing NaNoWriMo and practicing writing quickly. Um, so when you get a new book idea, who do you have to run it through in order to write it? Or do you just tell them you're writing so-and-so? I kind of just tell them I'm writing so and so. I'm like, this is what I'm working on. If you want it, okay. If you don't want it, that's cool. But then I'm going to usually shop it to other publishers if it's something that I really love and want to see published. What's the process for getting involved with anthologies? How do short story writers go about getting published? I am the wrong person to ask that. I've only been in um, like three anthologies, uh, I guess four. Um, and they've all asked me to be in them. But it's because basically most anthologies, an author asks, like authors to be in them. So like when um, when the new Defy the Dark anthology that Sandra Mitchell's editing, she asked a lot of authors that, that she liked their work and that she knew and that were, you know, her peers and colleagues to be in it, things like that. What if you can't stick to a book idea? Do you ever find this difficult? Yes, I find that difficult, but I think it's sort of what I said earlier. This is what separates the men from the boys or the women from the girls. I don't know. <laughs> Um, do I find it difficult? Yes. Of course it's difficult. Of course it's hard. But I, I do it anyway, and so should you, okay? Don't make excuses for yourself and say, well, it's really difficult, and I just can't stick with anything I write, and I just can never get through middles. I'm just really bad at middles, and, uh, you know, I just can never get to the ending before I get a new idea. Those are all excuses, and those are all ways that you're going to talk yourself out of being successful. Um, I get very fired up about that. Um, can agents ever refuse to represent a new book you write? Um, they can, but honestly, if my agent flat out refused to represent something, I would leave that agent because that means that they're no longer a wise business decision for you. And as soon as they are no longer a wise business decision, that's also hard to say, um, then you're, you're done here. Okay, so hold on. After you're published, you don't have to finish a book to get it sold. No, after you're published, you have a little bit of an easier time selling on proposal, which is like, you know, five chapters. Don't jump on me. Which is like five chapters and a synopsis. Um, you can't always do that, but it just makes it a little bit easier. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so let me go ahead and answer some of my frequently asked questions. Um, one of the things I get asked a lot is, how do you deal with criticism? Um, how do you deal with mean reviews? How do you deal with, I mean, criticism from anybody? And the truth is, is that um, I try to ignore it. Sometimes it sucks. I try not to say anything. Sometimes I do because I can't help myself. Um, and I regret later. If you're ready to be a, a professional, then that means you are ready to share your work with the world. And when you share your work with the world, sometimes, you know, sometimes people are going to have negative opinions of it. And that is, that is just the way of things. And honestly, you got to get over it. Um, I have been called a lot of names for some of the things that I write and it sucks, but at the end of the day, I, I try to remember that I've probably been called a lot worse by a lot better. So, okay. Uh, another question that I get a lot is, uh, when should you give up? 
Like, at what point should you give up? And the truth is, is that I never think if you want to be a writer, <laughs> I never think you should just give up on writing. I always think you should write something. That said, there does come a time when you need to step away from a certain book, okay? If you have been working on the same book for over like three years, walk away from it. You're too close to the project. It's been too long. There's no reason that, unless there is a really good reason that it took you, like the only reason that I can see why it would take you three years to write a book is if you were talking about a hugely long book and you have like a full-time job and kids. Then I can see three years and more. Other than that, honestly, if it's taking that long, I think there's probably a reason it's taking that long, and that's that it's not a cohesive enough idea, and I think you should step away and work on something else. Um, don't there, the, the book I wrote in high school, I wrote it in high school. Uh, it was called The Key Bearer. And let's see, I wrote it in high school. I rewrote it in college, and it ended up being the first, age, the first uh, book that I queried to agents. I probably spent combined five to seven years on that book. And you know what, at the end of the day, it wasn't that good a book. And I was spending so long trying to fix it and like paste it back together and you know, build this house when the truth of the matter was the, the foundation was cracked, okay? That's why it was taking me so long was because the book was broken at its core. There is nothing wrong with saying, I'll come back to you later and working on something else in the interim. And I think that it can be very, very refreshing. Um, okay. With that comes the how do you know when you're done, and we sort of, we sort of covered this when I was doing the pre-agent in section one. Um, how do you know when you're done? You don't, and you will never feel that you're completely done, but you know when you're done, not when you're just like, well, that's the best I can do right now, or that's the best I could think of. It's done when it's the best book it can possibly be, not just the best you can do right now, or the best you can do without having to change a bunch of stuff, or the best you can do while working full time, no the best book it can be, and that's when you're done. Okay, um, <laughs> let's see, okay, I have a few other frequently asked questions that I'm going to get through. Uh, it's the key bearer was the name of it, and it's not very good, there's a reason it didn't get published. And no, I'm not saving it and I'm not going to release it later, like it's not a good book. Okay, um, <laughs> so I'm gonna talk about two quasi-controversial things really quickly. Um, one is self-publishing. So I have a lot of opinions on self-publishing. Um, I will admit that my opinions on self-publishing have changed a lot. At the end of the day, I think that if you feel like you are lucky enough that you can self-publish a book and make a career out of it, I think you should probably play the lottery instead. Because if you're that lucky, start buying tickets. Um, it is very, very, very difficult to make it work, self-publishing. And I know there are stories about people that have, okay? I know about Amanda Hawking. You don't need to tell me. I know about that dude that they've splashed across the front page of Amazon. There are a lot of people that it works for, okay? And, and, and good for them. But there are so many more that never make a dime. And once a book is self-published, it is really hard to get a publisher or an agent to touch it with a 10-foot pole. And once you've self-published, I think it makes you as an author harder to take, um, I don't want to say seriously, but I think that's what I'm going to say. Once you've self-published, it's sort of, it's sort of like, well, why did he have to self-publish the first time? Why couldn't he get a, was he not good enough to get a traditional publisher? Why? I'm not really sure. You know, it sort of makes people raise their eyebrows at you. Um, <laughs> the thing about self-publishing is everybody can do it. Like, while I could copy and this chat that's in my little window right here, I could copy it and I could put it in a Word document and in less than three hours I could have loaded it to Amazon and by tomorrow morning it would be for sale. Would it be a good book? No, absolutely not. <laughs> but that's the thing about self-publishing is when anyone can do it, it just makes you ask certain questions because if I see a book on a shelf that's been traditionally published and to be honest with you, just about every single book you see on the shelf in the YA section at the bookstore has been traditionally published. Very few self-published authors make it into bookstores. So when I see a book on a, book a bookstore, um, and it's published by one of those big seven publishers that we talked about earlier, I see it on the shelf in the bookstore, and I think somebody liked that book enough to probably represent it as an agent, <laughs> an editor liked it enough to buy it, an editor liked it enough to off offer the author in advance, 
they maybe they have more books out a design team has professionally designed the cover it's been professionally edited it's been professionally copy edited it's been presented well to me here okay those are all the things that I can assume when I see a book on a bookstore none of those things are assumptions about the quality of the writing inside okay but those are assumptions about what I will be purchasing with my 1799 or whatever it is um, now there's something in my eye if I see a book online for sale and it's been self-published I don't have to assume anything I don't have to assume the person even has a, a decent grip of the English language if I'm looking at a book in English I don't have to assume any editor has ever looked at it I don't have to assume a copy editor has ever looked at it I don't even have to assume they've run spell check okay I don't have to make any assumptions so when I'm gonna spend my money on a product I would be Personally, I feel I am much better off spending money on the product that has, in my opinion, a better chance of being a good product than a self-published book. Now, that is not to say that, that a self-published book cannot be a good book, because like I said, none of those assumptions were commentary on the writing itself. The writing might be brilliant, but that's why I think it makes it very difficult to, to sort of succeed as a self-published author you're swimming in the sea of other self-published authors there are so many of them out there it's hard to make things work I will also say that I self-published some short stories um, just for kicks I self-published some short stories under a pen name on Amazon I had every advantage I knew how to set up an Amazon central account I knew how to market it I know how to look for book reviewers I knew how to set up a Goodreads account I had every advantage I've sold maybe 15 to 20 copies total of both short stories maybe and and that was um, you know that was they, they, they weren't YA so like it was even and it was in a market that tends to embrace ebooks more so you know I just think it's really 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 hard to make it work um, when should you self publish if you have a book that is for a very small audience one time I was on a panel with a guy who had self published a book he wrote the book was about kids at conventions and he sold it at conventions okay self publish um, if you have had um, uh, several books come out already and you're able to sort of promote and market uh, and, and sort of send your online fans toward your self published title Sure, maybe self-publish one. If you've got a finished book just laying around um, that that, and you've got other books that have already been traditionally published and you've got a fan base, instead of just letting it sit in a drawer, maybe self-publish it then. Um, Caleb's a good example. He has a huge online following. Um, he had two books come out, but he doesn't really, he didn't, I don't think he was interested in going that same route. He's got such a big online following, I can kind of see why he self-published. There are certain situations where I can understand it. However, if you want to be a full -time and you want to support yourself and you want to be in bookstores you reviewed and you want to be treated as a is usually the way to go that said I mean, it's your call it is totally your call um, so yeah I think that that is a little yeah I don't know um, okay, and the other thing that I'm going to talk about that is a little bit controversial is book blogging, okay? Um, if you have a book blog where you are reviewing books and you are hoping to eventually become a published author, I would personally really, really consider getting rid of the book blog. Here is why. This is not a question of freedom of speech. In a perfect, beautiful, sunny, fantastic world, you should be able to give a, 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 a you know an honest critical review of a book that you didn't like and you should be able to be professional about it and you should be able to post it on the internet and no one should be able to get upset But we don't live in a beautiful perfect sunny world we live in a world where, where people get offended and where authors get upset and where um, you know uh, things get where publishers can find things that you posted years later because of the Wayback Machine uh, okay so once you have put those things on the internet they never really go away and in five years eight years ten years maybe those colleagues maybe those authors that you reviewed you might want them to be your colleagues and I'll be honest with you if you gave them a scathing review they might remember that okay I got a hello cat you can't stay I'm doing something um, I got a blurb request from somebody that had given me one of the worst reviews of my life 
And, and I don't think she, she, like, she didn't say anything about it. I don't think she realized that I knew, but I was like, why would you want a blurb from me? You hate my books. Like, why would you, why would you want that? I don't understand. So I think that if you want to be in the industry, that it is very risky to spend your formative years critiquing people in the industry. Um, it is your call. Um, it, like I said, it's not a question of freedom of speech and it shouldn't be an issue at all. But I'm trying to be really honest with you and tell you that I think that it can be. And I think that if you are going to start critiquing books and talking about why certain books aren't good, that later on you might have to own up to those things that you said. Just be aware that, that people are reading them and that authors have Google Alerts set up so as soon as you type their name in, they see your review, they know what you're saying. And there are some authors that aren't going to care, and there are some authors that are going to be really angry. There are some authors that are never going to see it. But it seems to me kind of like, why would you risk it? Like, why, if, if that's really what you want to do, that seems like a pretty big risk to take. If you want to be a published author, it just seems like too much of a risk for me, um, personally. This is why I never did book blogging. Um, but you know what? It's, it's your call. Like, it's totally, it, it is, again, it is the industry business side of things. And if you are ready to enter that, then you are ready to make your own decisions and your own sort of what have you. Okay, so my voice is starting to go. It is, uh, it is 9.49 um, by my clock. Um, I am going to answer questions for 15 minutes if anybody has any additional questions. That is everything I wanted to say. We have been here for almost two hours. Um, so that is everything I really had to comment on. My hair is doing a thing. We don't know. Um, so if you have questions, this would be the time. I'm going to do this thing again while I, while I sit. My nose is just so bad. I don't know why. What is happening? Also, the chat froze for me. Okay. Um... Do the designers for the cover read the book before constructing a fitting cover? Not necessarily. Sometimes they do, but not always. Um, how do you know if your book isn't good? That's a really, it depends on who you are. You know, it's, it depends on a lot of different things. I, I, I don't know that I can answer that question. Um, uh, how do you outline the middle of the book if you know the main ideas and climax? Um, I actually did a video on outlining, and I think I might do another. Now there's something in my eye. I'm a mess, guys. Um, I don't really know how to answer that question, how to outline the middle. I mean, I outline the whole thing. I just do the whole thing. I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't have a good answer for that. Oh, my gosh. I don't know what's in my eye, but it is a problem. It is a problem in my life. Yeah. Okay. Um, will you ever do this again, love? This is a lot of time and a lot of energy to do these things, so I try to sort of space them out. I'm sure I'll do one at some point in the future, but not um, in the near future, I'm sure. Um, how often do agents, publishers take on a book with an overtly obvious lead into a sequel from a new author? Um, I, I mean, I don't know how often in terms of percentage. There are a lot of trilogies and, and series that sell, um, but know that if they're committing to that, that's a big commitment. Um, it's a big commitment from them. What is, oh, it's my phone is ringing. Um, that's a really big commitment, so they probably are going to want to see a full first book and probably summaries of the subsequent books. Um, you know, it, it, it happens, but I think I think um, editors are more interested or, or, or sometimes more interested in a standalone book that has series potential than they are in, like, taking on a five-book series or something. Like, if you've got a ten-book series, that's going to be really tough to sell. Um, it happens. Um, that Night Circus... Um, woman sold like what like seven books or eight books for a gazillion dollars. I don't know what the official number was um, I've done a lot of outlining videos and I did a huge outlining live show So I don't think I'm going to talk too much about outlining here because my outlining process is pretty involved um, But uh, so yeah, how do you pitch companion novels the same way I pitch any other novel? I write a synopsis uh, about three to five chapters and I send it in so Thank you. I'm glad you like my necklace. How long do you leave your sticky note outlines up? Because mine still peel on the corners even though it has been a while. Um, I leave my sticky note outlines up for a long time, basically until I don't need them anymore. So there's still one on the wall. You just can't see it right now. It's on the other wall. Um, 
How do you organize your notes? I use Scrivener, and I use their sort of research section, which is how, yeah, I'm telling you guys, Scrivener is the way to go. I'm writing a book that has a cliffhanger. How do, how do I query a book like that? Should I write an alternative ending without a cliffhanger? Does it end on a cliffhanger because you're interested in going into a second book? Because in that case, you should query it as a series. I would consider writing an alternative ending that doesn't have a cliffhanger but still leaves an open ending, so you could write a series if you wanted to if it were me. But that is me, and this is your book. Um, is there the same faux pas against indie published authors as self-published? Um, okay, so I actually don't really understand the term indie published because, and people are like, it's not e-publishing, it's entrepreneurial. No, no you're self-publishing. Um, there are these companies that are calling themselves indie publishers, and I think they're really, really skeezy, to be honest with you, because all they're really doing is, is formatting your book for the e-market, like they're formatting it into an EPUB file and submitting it for you, and then they're your publisher, but like they haven't actually done really anything. So I don't really understand exactly what indie publishers are, and I feel like there must be a big difference between them all, so I'm not sure. Um, but I would think that they are still... I don't, when I see somebody that is indie published, I don't think, they're, I, I assume a lot of the same things I would assume about them if they were self-published, so. Um, should the synopsis be a separate part of the query? If they've asked for a synopsis, yes, that's on a whole different page. The blurby part, though, the, the ones who punch, the, the pitch, that's in your query. Where's your outlining video? If you go to my YouTube page and you type in outlining, it should show up. Um... Any other questions? We have 10 minutes left. <sighs> my voice is so tired. I can feel it. It's all, I can feel like my throat going that. Nah. Anyone? Did you want to be an author first, or did you have an idea for a story first? I really don't remember. I started writing books when I was like nine or so, um, and so I feel like I must have had a story first. Um, how to go at querying a book written by two authors. That is a little bit tricky. Um, honestly, I think that you should just query as two authors and be upfront about it. I know um, some friends of mine that they wrote a book together, they tried to create a pen name and query as the pen name, which also works, but um, I don't really see any reason not to be upfront with it, honestly. Um, how hard was it for you writing through college? It was difficult, but if you want to do it, then you're going to make it work. Um, how should you query a series? Um, if you're going to query a series, series are just tricky, guys. They're really tricky to query. Um, you should basically give the pitch for the first book, which is the one that you finished, and then you should explain briefly where the series is going, um, in, in another, in another paragraph, really briefly. Um, okay. Um, can you recommend any query critique sites? Um, I actually don't know that I know of any query critique websites, to be entirely honest with you. I don't know that there are any. There, I'm sure there are. Um, okay, so we seem to be sort of draining on questions. Am I right? Does anybody have any last minute? And I'm not really doing personal questions on my books. I'm doing publishing industry questions. So does anybody have any last questions and then we will wrap things up? This is your chance. Don't, don't blow it. Chance. <laughs> My poor throat. Anyone? Anyone? It's so awkward sitting here waiting for the delay. Um, do you need an educational degree of any sort to be published? Um, no, but you will never regret getting an education. So if your question is, should I go to college, the answer is yes. If your question is, do I have to major in English to be an author, the answer is no. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and, and end things. I did want to throw this out there um, because I'm, there's something that I'm starting to do um, now. Um, I'm taking on some freelance editing clients, um, which basically means that um, if you're interested, I will read your book for you. I will give you like a detailed feedback, which is basically the same sort of um, letter that my editor gives me. If you're interested in more than that, I can do a line by line edit of your manuscript. If you're interested in more than that, I can look at your query for you. Um, we can discuss 
problems in your in your book, things like that. We can basically we can do whatever you need me to help you do to make your book better. Um, if you are interested in that, uh, I'm only taking on a few clients because I do have books that are due, but I am really really excited about doing it because I do really really enjoy editing and I really like watching books become better and bigger and cooler. Um, if you are interested in that, um, if you want to email me, my um, email address for this is Jackson Pierce Classes. So Jackson, J-A-C-K-S-O-N, Pierce, P-E-A-R-C-E, classes, C-L-A-S-S-E-S, at gmail.com. Um, you, can, you can send it to my regular email address, Jackson and jacksonpierce.com, too. That's fine. But either way, um, if you're interested in that, please shoot me an email. Tell me a little bit about your project, and I can get back to you with sort of rates, and we can discuss and things like that. Um, I am only doing it for people that are over 18. Um, there are a lot of different reasons for that. It is not because I think that if you are under 18, you are not a good writer and that you are not worth my time because that is not the case at all. Um, I'm mostly doing it for people that are over 18 just because I am so afraid that if you are like under 18 and in high school that I'm going to say something that will crush your dreams and you'll never want to write again. <laughs> that is honestly the reason that I'm saying 18 and up. So. Um, if you're interested, you know, it's something that I'm doing, um, and I'm really excited to start doing it, and so it's a cool, it's a cool thing. So, um, yeah, good times. Um, okay, well, I'm going to call it a day. I'm going to go. I am going to leave this up. I'm not sure how long I'm going to leave it up. Um, we're kind of kind of see. I don't think I said anything too stupid, so hopefully it's not a problem for me to leave it up. But thank you guys so, so, so much for coming. If it was helpful, please shoot me an email and let me know. Um, if you're interested in editing, editing, blah, that is a hard word to say. Editing, please shoot me an email and let me know. And otherwise, I will see you on Twitter and on YouTube and around the internets, as it would be. Okay? So, it was good seeing you. Thank you guys so much for coming. I really appreciate it, and I appreciate your support. I appreciate you subscribing to my channel and following me and being here and commenting so I wasn't alone talking to my ass for too long. See, this is why I see now I can't leave it up forever because now I've said something stupid. Oh, self. Okay, so farewell. I will talk to you later. Bye.